Hi there, welcome to SCN Unplugged. My name is Mark Small and in this week's edition we're going to be looking at how the local authorities write education, health and care plans. So at this point the local authority has completed the EH Needs Assessment and is now deciding whether it's going to issue what's called the Education, Health and Care Plan. Now the important thing here, just to recap, are the timescales involved so that you can be clear that the local authority are following the correct procedure. Now, in the first instance, the whole process from when you first make your EHC needs request to the issuing of the final EHC plan should take a maximum of 20 weeks. So, the local authority can only go over above, can only go above that time scale in exceptional circumstances. And usually those are because the setting's been closed for four weeks, so they've not been able to seek advice from them. The parent or the child is suffering from what's called exceptional circumstances and perhaps can't participate in the assessment. Or, or perhaps um, the parent or the child is actually out of the area for a period of four weeks or more. So perhaps they've gone abroad and therefore the assessment cannot be completed. Other than that, those are the only basis upon which an extension could be sought by the local authority. So 20 weeks is the maximum. Now that can be broken down into a number of different elements. So in the first instance, the local authority has six weeks to respond to requests for EH needs assessments. Um, and when it, ta it takes that six weeks, that's when it's gathering the information. When it actually agrees to carry out the assessment, it essentially has to issue the education, health and care plan, or to make a decision on whether it's not going to issue one within 16 weeks of that process starting. Um, that will then leave it four weeks to send a draft EHC plan to parents and carers to comment on and then to finalise. And parents and carers have 15 days from receiving the draft to be able to comment on the, EC, the EHC plan and to express preferences then for the educational setting. And usually parents are invited to what's called a co-production meeting whereby they'll meet with professionals, the local authority and the school to look at the draft EHC plan if that is going to be issued. If the local authority refuses at week 16 to issue an EHC plan, then they'll write to you, give you the reasons why, um, and that will trigger a right of appeal for you to the Special Education Rates Disability Tribunal, where you can appeal against the refusal to issue an EHC plan. So now we've dealt with the timescales. The critical factor now is to look at the Education, Health and Care Plan and how that's constructed. So the EHC plan will be issued where it's necessary for the local authority to provide the educational setting with additional resources. Um, and they do this by issuing the Education, Health and Care Plan. The Education, Health and Care Plan is a bit like a prescription. It describes the difficulties that your child has and it provides the support that's going to address those difficulties. And that's put it in a very crude way. The important thing about your EHC plan when you receive it in draft form, uh, about, as I say, about week 16 of the process, is that it is specific and quantified. Now, what does that mean? Essentially, the EHC plan is a bit like, as I said, like a prescription. It details the difficulties, but then it should specify how each of the identified difficulties are going to be met. So, for example, by the provision of a certain amount of adult support, by the provision of a certain amount of perhaps specialist teaching or therapies. And the local authority's duty is then to secure that special educational needs support for the child through the EHC plan. Now, the EHC plan itself, when you first receive it, can be quite a cumbersome document. It's divided into 11 different sections, sections A to K, and the law requires the local authority in those sections to specify the child's special educational needs, and you'll see those in section B, to identify the outcomes sought for the child, those will be found in section E, the SEM provision that's required to meet the child's needs, those will be in section F, and any health and social care provision reasonably required to support the learning difficulties. Now those difficulties will be identified in section C and D, and provision from health and social care will then be specified in sections G and H. Now when they're creating the plan, the local authority has to have regard to the child's age and the outcomes that are sought for them. The local authority also has to have regard to the SCN Code of Practice when it's issuing the draft education, health and care plan. 
And I think a, a good starting point for parents is to look at paragraph 9.61 of the code. And that sets out in detail, and a little table is actually set out in the code, which breaks down how each of the sections should be drafted and what factors need to be considered. So you need to have a look at that part of the code of practice. And what it should also do, and this is very important to bear this in mind, the EHC plan should be a document that the educational setting can use. It should be able to pick it up and run with it as soon as it receives it. So although there's no hard and fast rule about the length of the EHC plan, um, in my view, they should be no more than 11 pages. And where the focus should be um, is on sections B, the special educational needs, and the provision that's been identified in section F. Um, in, so, in other words, the less, the less length they are, the better. And, and I think it's really important because a lot of time is wasted by creating over-elaborate documents which ultimately are then not usable for the setting. If you have a usable EHC plan, this makes it easier to amend and review. And that clearly is important um, moving forward um, when you're working with perhaps different educational providers. So how do local authorities approach issues of specificity and quantification? Well, the regulations that accompany the Children and Families Act identify the kind of things that the local authority has to address when they're drafting the EHC plan. And those things can be summarised as appropriate facilities that are required for the child, any equipment, um, that may be needed, the staffing arrangements, so the level of adult support, the training and experience of the staff, and whether there's any modification necessary to the national curriculum. So, um, for example, children can be um, removed from foreign languages and that can be made part of their special needs provision. Um, the child could be educated out of year, that can also be part of their special educational needs provision. Um, the other points that can be put into this EHC plan are if the child is attending a residential school and thus the level of residential provision can be specified. The local authority also has to specify if there is a personal budget in use and what it's um, intended to address and you'll find the personal budget specified in section J where it's applicable. So the first section of the education, health and care plan is section A. Now section A of the education, health and care plan essentially provides an overview. Um, it provides an overview perhaps of the child's difficulties, what their aspirations are, what their goals are. Um, it details perhaps their relationships, their school history um, and their views. Um, now a lot of time can be spent on section A um, and in my view too much time is spent. Um, it doesn't need to be that long, in fact it could be a few paragraphs. The important thing is if you've got detailed advice or a detailed history or views that you want to have included, then those can be reflected in the appendices to the EHC plan. So bear in mind, this document is supposed to be usable. So if section A, let's say, is seven or eight pages, then that's a lot of information that someone's going to have to digest. And perhaps they're not then going to look at the more relevant bits of the EHC plan, which they're actually required to deliver. So section A should be drafted tightly with detail provided in the appendices. Then we go on to section B. Now this is really, really an important section of the EHC plan. So this is where the local authority is required to specify and identify the child's special educational needs. Now it's normally done under particular headings that have been identified and those use headings from the code of practice. So things like cognition and learning, speech, language and communication, social, emotional and mental health, physical and sensory. And those are the headings by which the needs are then populated. Now the important thing here is it should describe all of the learning difficulties. It should identify what they can do, but also what they can't do. So it, it needs to be relatively detailed in comparison to the other sections. But essentially should specify clearly the difficulties that the child has accessing education and notifying particular strengths where, they, where those arise. Section B will generally be formed from the educational advice that's provided, perhaps from the educational psychologist, maybe a speech and language therapist or occupational therapist or a specialist teacher. 
Um, the, lo the local authority may also take into account parental views, but they're going to look at the expert advice in identifying what those needs are. Then we go to section C. Now, section C is where the health needs are specified. Now, what happens when the local authority carries out the age needs assessment is that they're required to seek advice from the health service and they will do this through the designated medical officer. Now, this, the clinical commissioning group, or CCG, is ultimately responsible for what goes into this section because it represents the health advice for the assessment. And perhaps what you'll find here are where particular diagnoses are described. Perhaps the child's diagnosis of autism or epilepsy, for example, or a physical difficulty um, will be specified here. And it's possible to have the same difficulties also identified in section B, but the advice that comes within section C comes from the health service and it's for the health service to agree with the local authority how its advice should be specified in section C. Section D of the Education, Health and Care Plan deals with any advice that's come from social care assessments or involvement. So, and it's where those social care needs have an impact on the child's learning. So things here perhaps that, which are, are relevant are maybe where there are different carers, maybe there's respite providers who are involved, who've identified particular difficulties, um, and this, this, this is where that advice would be, would be specified. Um, you might also have reference in this section if the child is subject to child protection plans or, or where perhaps there have been concerns about a child's keep. So, if the child's been neglected and that's, that's been investigated by the local authority, that's where that could be, could be identified. So that's section D. The next section we're going to look at is section E. Now section E specifies the outcomes. So the outcomes are essentially how, what are we expecting the young person to attain as a result of the special educational needs support we're going to provide them. Now outcomes are very, very difficult to define. Um, there's some argument that they should be short term, and there's another argument that says they should be long term. My view is that the outcomes really should be geared to the key stage that the child is within. That means that they can be more measurable and it's then easier to change them when the child moves up into the next key stage. Um, shorter term targets can be covered through, let's say, IEPs or particular programmes that are then run by the school to meet the child's difficulties. I think the important thing is that when the EHC plan is being constructed, the parents are consulted about the outcomes um, and feed into that process. They shouldn't simply be imposed on you. Then we get to perhaps the most important part of the EHC plan, Section F. Now, Section F of the Education, Health and Care Plan is the responsibility of the local education authority. They're responsible for ensuring that the provision that's specified in this section is delivered and it's called a non-delegable duty. So often one of the issues, and we'll be talking about it a little bit later, one of the issues that parents experience is that this section is often vague um, and left unspecific. So what kind of things need to be specified here? So the kind of things that you can have specified are the size of classes. So for example, if the child needs to be educated in a class of say not more than six children, that fact should be specified if that's what the evidence says. The staff qualifications and experience should be specified. So for example, um, if a child is to receive a particular level of learning support assistance, what level of learning support is needed? Is that from someone who's newly trained or is that from someone who's experienced? Is it from someone who, who holds a particular qualification? So in special educational needs circles, there are lots of different training courses and levels of expertise. So, for example, does the, does the LSA need to have a specific qualification in autism to be able to support the child? Do they need to have a particular qualification in speech and language to be able to deliver the intervention? Those kind of things can be specified. The other things that can be specified as well are if the child is to have specific interventions, for example, a literacy intervention, a numeracy intervention, a small group intervention to support social communication, the frequency size of those groups should be specified. The person delivering the group should be specified. Their level of training should be specified. How often it's reviewed should be specified. 
the amount of individual LSA support should be specified, including if that support is to be shared. So there's a lot of confusion in EHC plans. Um, if, if, for example, it says the young person is going to receive 25 hours of support, some schools interpret that as, well, we can use that support for other children as well. It's not simply for that child. That's not correct. So you need to make sure that the support is properly focused on supporting the individual child. The input of external professionals, speech therapists, specialist teachers, occupational therapists, educational psychologists can also be specified. Um, and it's more likely that you'll have frequent provision from say specialist teachers and therapists rather than the educational psychologist. But nonetheless, the, the amount of support that they're going to provide should be specified. Now it's worth just saying in respect of Section F that provision which educates or trains the child is always regarded as special educational needs provision and therefore must be included in Section F of the Education, Health and Care Plan. So it's very rare that, for example, speech and language therapy, which although is health provision, would be specified, say, in Section G, which is the health part of the plan. The reason being is that unless the evidence is very clear, the majority of, say, speech and language provision is going to educate or train the child and therefore is special needs provision and goes in Section F. Now, the reason why that's important is, as I said at the very beginning, if it's in Section F, it's the responsibility of the local authority to arrange it, not the health service. Um, and that's why it's very important in terms of ensuring that the provision is put into the right sections of the EHC plan. So now we look at Section G of the plan. Section G of the plan deals with health provision which has been recommended to be included in this part of the plan and it's essentially for the CCG to determine what that provision might be based on um, the advice that it's provided for the EHC needs assessment. So in my experience it typically involves things like um, medical treatments, the administration of medication, some therapies that are not, that don't educate or train the child perhaps perhaps psychological input that comes through the child and adolescent mental health services, perhaps nursing support comes in here, specialist equipment, perhaps like wheelchairs, those kind of things tend to fall within section G. The important thing to do if you've got a doubt is to ask um, when the EHC plan is being drafted why particular provision has been placed in section say F or section G and then at least you can understand the rationale for that and if necessary challenge it. Then we get to section H. Now this is divided up into two parts, section H1 and section H2. Now section H1 um, essentially identifies all the services that are going to be provided by social care under the, under the Chronically Sick and Disabled Persons Act, um, which is a real old piece of legislation. But in real terms what that looks like in practice are uh, practical assistance in the home, um, support to access recreational or even educational facilities outside of school, perhaps adaptations to the home, respite for holidays, short breaks. That's often what we'll find here in Section H1, where social care have identified that need following a social care assessment. Then we get to Section H2, which is essentially an extension of the first section and it includes services that are essentially not covered under that piece of legislation. So things that can come in here generally are provision that's secured through a direct payment provided by social care, residential short breaks um, and services arising from SEN but unrelated to disability also are likely to come into this section. The important thing is actually identifying those services in your social care assessments when they've been undertaken. Then we have Section I of the Education, Health and Care Plan. Section I identifies the educational setting that the child's going to attend. And when you receive your draft Education, Health and Care Plan from the local authority, as I said, at around week 16 of the process, you'll be invited to express a preference for an educational setting in this part of the plan. Now, the law allows you to make what they call statutory preferences and also preferences under what's called Section 9 of the Education Act. So this is essentially where you can put forward your specific educational setting for your child and the local authority is required to consult with that setting and to decide whether they're going to name it in the EHC plan. 
and it's up to the local authority ultimately to decide what name goes into the plan. In some circumstances, and they're very unusual, the local authority does have a power to name a type of setting if, for example, it's not been able to identify a particular named school at that point. And often that happens where children are being described as hard to place and where they, at the, at the time of issuing the final EHC plan, are not in a position to name a school. Section J of the Education, Health and Care Plan details the personal budget that's to be provided where it's allocated. Um, so the amount of money will be specified here and a description of the provision and the outcomes that it's targeted to meeting will be specified in Section J. And Section K, last but not least, is the appendices to the EHC plan. So that they comprise all of the advices that have been gathered as part of the EH needs assessment and they are then broken down into Section K. They will include the advice from parents, the advice from the school, the advice from the educational psychologist and the advice from health and social care. So we now need to think about responsibility for the EHC plan and the various provisions that have been specified. So as I identified, the local authority is responsible for, if you like, the special educational needs provision in the plan, section F. They're responsible for casting the plan in the first place and bringing everyone together and coordinating the advice. Um, what the local authority is not responsible for are the health and social care parts of the plan. So section C, D, G and H. Um, and in those sections, it's the responsibility of health and social care to ensure that the provision that's specified is provided and parents will be able to challenge a failure of those, of those agencies if that provision is not provided through a mechanism called judicial review. And that's something that we can talk about in a different video. If you're looking to challenge the health service, then a clinical commissioning group is going to be responsible. Um, now both health and social care have statutory complaints procedures that they, ha that they would have to observe. But as I said, if provision is specified in the plan in those sections and it's not delivered, then you have a, a potential remedy through what's called judicial review and that's where a public body is failing to discharge its statutory duties. Key thing for parents is ensuring that all the special needs provision is specified in section F and then the local authority can be challenged if they don't provide it. Now sadly the issuing of the EHC plan causes quite a lot of difficulties for local authority. Um, and the majority of EHC plans, in my experience, are unlawful. And you might think, well, why? Well, the first thing is there's no standard template for the EHC plan itself. Um, and this has left it for local authorities to create, which, to be fair, was always asking for trouble. So the things that you can probably encounter with the EHC plan, that they're far too long, they're cumbersome to amend because of the way they've been formatted, and therefore they're difficult to review which is why often local authorities fail to properly review the EHC plans and to essentially break the time limits for amending them when they do. And that's something that I'm going to deal with in a different video. The special needs provision in the plan is often not specified to a satisfactory standard. Now, basically, my rule of thumb is, if you can't add up how many hours of support the child is getting, however it's so included in the plan, then it's an unlawful plan. The hours of support should be specified, the frequency of intervention should be specified, and the frequency of therapy should be specified. So that, as I said at the very beginning, this, is, this document is a bit like a prescription. It tells you what the difficulties are and how they're going to be addressed. And as parents, you should know what support is going to be provided and how it's going to be delivered in the school or, or, or educational setting. Um, the other issue that's often left out is um, training or experience is often not quantified as well. So that, that in practice means that your, could, your child could be supported by a newly qualified LSA um, who hasn't got the requisite experience. So these are all things to be thinking of when the draft EHC plan is being issued. What you definitely have to watch out for are what I call the weasel words. And these are words that... Um, are often included in EHC plans, so you need to look out for them. They include words like may receive, opportunities for, regular access to. These have generally been regarded in law as something that's not lawful because they leave the provision in doubt. Um, provision cannot be left unspecified um, and thus 
Um, another thing to look out for is provision subject to further assessment. So, for example, the level of support uh, will be determined by the speech and language therapist. That would not be lawful. They would have to describe clearly the therapeutic input that's going to be provided. So keep a lookout when you get your draft plan. Go through it with a highlighter and highlight where it's not specific and challenge the local authority. Challenge the professionals who provided the advice. And you can do that simply in a writing. Uh, send them an email and say you've not specified the provision. Now both the Royal College of Speech and Language Therapists and Occupational Therapists require their therapists to specify provision and they've issued guidance to them about the kinds of specificity that they have to include and that's something that you can download from their websites. Now as it is so problematic it's worth I think thinking about some golden rules when thinking about how we can make EHC plans more specific and quantified. So for me there are five key questions that you need to focus on. Number one what support is being provided or proposed? Who is delivering the support? How often is it going to be provided? When is it going to be monitored? And who monitors it and how often? So it's the who, it's the what, who, how, when, who monitors test. And it's important that those kind of questions are asked when you get your draft plan because if you answer them all it will lead to more specificity in the plan when thinking about particular provision. So I'm often asked about outcomes and that's it, that people find it very difficult to put those together. And I think just to give some examples, now that we've talked about the EHC plan and what, what it looks like, I think for me the outcomes need to be, um, they need to be smart, so they need to be measurable, um, they, need to be, um, they need to be for me set across the key stage and some things that I've always felt were quite important to include, for example, might be things like progressing from particular level to a higher level by the end of the academic year in a particular area. So, for example, to progress from level one to level two by the end of the academic year in reading, that could be an outcome. To be able to communicate uh, perhaps needs and wants to adults in school on a daily basis using a specific AAC system might be an outcome that can be described. Um, to be able to travel to school independently utilising public transport is an outcome that's reasonable, I think, to, to describe. Um, to be able to um, initiate appropriate social interaction with identified peers on a daily basis without adult support could be an, an example of an outcome. Um, and even to complete specific courses, so for example to complete and pass the BTEC in business would be an outcome. But these are things that are quite personal to the individual child and that's where, or a young person, and that's where these need to be very carefully constructed in consultation with parents, carers, schools, professionals, um, and of course the, the young person involved. Now I've put in some of the slides that accompany this particular video some examples of specificity so that you can have a little look at um, the kinds of things that sh should be specified and what they look like when they're properly specified. So have a little look at those. But essentially, as I, as I identified earlier, what this document really is, is a prescription. And it should detail very clearly how the special needs that have been identified in Section B are going to be addressed. And if that's not specified, well then how have you got any assurance of it being tackled by the educational setting? So have a look at those slides and then look at your own EHC plan and see, are these things addressed? Is there sufficient clarity over the frequency of the intervention, who's delivering it, um, and the outcome that it's seeking to, to address? So that was a whistle-stop tour of the Education Health and Care Plan. So what I would say about the writing of the EHC plan is it's important that you get good evidence from the EHC needs assessment, so when you're receiving feedback, it's always important to challenge experts if they're not being specific about the provision that they're recommending. And if you're not happy with that, then bear in mind you have a right to be able to complain to the local authority about it, perhaps even to the health service. And about the professional, you could complain to the Healthcare Professions Council if you think their advices are, are not sufficiently specific or quantified, because it's their role to do that. Um, that's the purpose of the EHC needs assessment, that is the purpose of the EHC plan.
Um, so when we're looking at writing the plan, you know, be aware of some of these factors when you're in your meeting with the local authority and, and comment where you're unhappy with, um, with what's being proposed and give alternative specificity um, if you can. There's always um, professional support available to parents at these meetings, often provided by advocates or from the Sendia service or indeed from solicitors. So don't be afraid to seek advice and to challenge. That's it for this week. Um, as always, if you like the video, please share, comment, subscribe and like. Um, I'm Mark Small. Let's make SCN great again.